All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode. That's right, the London is Blue podcast, hopefully your favorite Chelsea podcast out there, celebrating a a surprising win, a surprising Monday match win against Newcastle at Stamford Bridge. Dan, one of your hosts here alongside Nick, no Brandon Busby. Some good news, hopefully on the horizon very, very soon as relates to him not being available for this fixture, like the 11 Chelsea players who could not start in this game or make themselves available. But boy, oh boy, Nick, on a 48-hour stint where we got to see the Oscars, Oppenheimer's domination, Godzilla winning a special effects one, first first one for Godzilla franchise in over 70 years, incredible, great, great night, and another great night here at Chelsea get a win. So it's all good. Yeah, it's uh, it was really something, you know, Monday matches, not always the the best, uh, but, you know, Chelsea has been OK on, on Mondays this year so far. So, uh, yeah, happy, obviously, to get the win. I think, you know, we've uh, I'm going to credit Jack Bouchard, who was a part of our London trip uh, last last spring, uh, who said in our in our text thread, turning point number 73, guys, I feel like this is really the one. And Jack, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my uh, my favorite commentary from the day. Turning point number seventy three. Well, we're excited to talk about turning point number 73 and how that might lead to turning point number 74 in the (laughs) next coming days as Chelsea have more matches ahead. But look, we are a part of the Men in Blazers Media Network, and we're going to take you through what transpired in this game, which saw Chelsea winning, then drawing, then winning again, sort of comfortably, and then making it a little nervy at the very, very end. But at the end of the day, Chelsea do pick up a crucial three points in the Premier League to keep the dream of European football alive for another week. And we're going to talk about how we notched that big win in there. But of course, we throw it to the fans, the listeners first, Nick, with some three-word match reviews. And I've selected a cornucopia of options for you to choose from today. Cornucopia uh, giveth indeed Southeast blues with uh gusto appreciation post. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Kate price with wow. We won alliteration and good sentiment. Well, well done. Mike Williams with welcome back. Tino and friends dude took a beating more on that to come. <laughs> um, random Zambian guy with revenge serve coal cold. <clears throat> Uh, Aaron with more Monday matches now four and four on Monday nights. How about that? Brad with Sandler streak engaged. Apparently Adam Sandler was there tonight. Sloth on holiday with stone coal closer. I like that. Spanish Joe brown ale suck. That's right. Newcastle eat your heart out. And, uh, and mine before we get to a special one is Mudrick muds magpies alliteration from yours truly but dan you have a special three-word match review look i don't like to often dig into the whatsapp and reveal the messages we share with friends on the publication on the pod but this one is special the three-word match review for me is welcome charlie burridge good friend of the podcast adam burridge and his family welcome charlie into the world. That was quite, quite wonderful news. Actually, yesterday, so it would have been Mother's Day in the UK. Again, if you watch the Oscars, very confusing when you're watching it and you're like, wait a minute, Mother's Day? Yeah, I got asked that question about five times to explain it. But anyway, very excited for Charlie, for Adam, and uh, then his missus and the wonderful family that they have over there. Very, very exciting news and way more important than the football itself. But hey, Chelsea showed up and made sure that three points were delivered on the day. So very, very good from them. But Nick, a quick bit of admin. We always want to thank our wonderful people who leave five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. We enjoy everybody who is jumping on YouTube, subbing to the channel, hitting that like button, hitting that subscribe button, hitting the notify bell, doing all the wonderful things, liking, commenting on the videos. The people who read the newsletter, you're fantastic as well. Sam does it every week mostly on Wednesdays, sometimes a little later. Apologies for that, but we'll get back on track there. And you can also join the conversation free or paid with Discord too. So plenty of ways to get involved. But look, the match was against Newcastle. It was this past Monday, March 11th in the Premier League at Sanford Bridge. And the scoreline, Chelsea 3, 2 to Newcastle. Nico Jackson got us started in the sixth minute. Then Isak came back in the 43rd and said, nah, this ain't going to be easy. 
Palmer comes back though in the 57th minute with a wonderful goal, followed by Mudrick in the 76th minute, and then Murphy with a stunner in the 90th minute to give you just a little bit of tense activity in the dying six minutes of stoppage time where we just can't make the easy decision of running to the corner flag, Nick. <laughs> where did it go? Where did the idea of running to the corner flag go? Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that as we get through the second half thoughts for sure. But, uh, boy, it is, uh, frustrating to watch us at the end of games, uh, in, in indeed, but you know what, Dan, I'll take the lineup off your hands. Don't you worry about it. I got it. It's all me. Gentlemen. Um, that's what I do. So Georgie Petrovic making his, uh, 1 million start between the sticks. I'm kidding. That's not the real number, but you get the point and long may he reign doing a good job. Uh, Malagusto, Axel Dizasi, Trev Chalba. Come on, man. I love it. And Mark Kukurea making up the back line. Kukurea back after going missing, apparently, for three and a half months. He's back now, so there you go. Uh, Enzo and Moises Caicedo make up the midfield. Raheem Sterling on the left wing. Connor Gallagher in the midfield. Cole Palmer on the right. Nico Jackson up top. Subs. Uh, Mikhailo Mudrik, pretty important sub in the 71st minute. Cesare Cassade in the 86th minute and Carney Chocomeca. Please stay healthy this time in the 90th minute uh, with unused subs of Robert Sanchez, Alfie Gilchrist, Josh Akimbong, uh, Tiago Silva, David Washington, and Noni Madaweke. So lots going on here, Dan, from an expected goals perspective, but I'll let you nerd out on the stats. You know, I love them. 1.67 to the Chelsea. 0.80 to Newcastle. So, and I think that might just mostly have been the one shot in total that we saw at the very, very end of the game. We had 45% possession to their 55%, 12 total shots to their 11, eight on target though, to their three. We had four off target Much to better. their five. And we blocked, th- uh, they blocked three of our shots in total. Uh, they had four corner kicks. We had none. We had two offsides to their two, 12 fouls to their seven, three yellow cards to their one, which feels a little lopsided. And then we had two big chances. We only missed one of them, though, on the day. No big chances for Newcastle. So it limited them appropriately. And the one random stat, 2001, Chelsea have not lost a home Premier League game in the month of March since 2001. It was 2-4 versus Sutherland. We've gone unbeaten in 38 such matches since then. 32 and six wins and draws. I heard this stat before the game and I had mentally checked it as this is going to be the thing that breaks today in terms of 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 runs. First of all, Opta, fuck you. Okay. Uh, Joe in particular here. Don't put this out before a game. Put it out after the game, after we've continued the streak. We're fragile right now. We don't need the extra pressure of trying to, extend a streak to to 39 games. I mean, this is ridiculous, but uh, it's actually kind of a cool stat when you think about it, because you don't really know how many home games you're going to play in a given month because schedules get moved, cup games get added, all that sort of stuff um, in March. And, you know, for the better part of the last, you know, 23 years, Chelsea have been running Chelsea in the spring where they've won and done really good stuff. And so, it's probably not a massive surprise that the record is good. I just didn't think it was that good. Uh, that's a pretty outstanding stat back there. Well, look, we, we still have currently on schedule Chelsea and Burnley on March 30th, so we can still go absolutely pear-shaped with this one, but at least for now, <laughs> it is secured. Nick, why don't you give us your shithouse moment of the match, the end pet. Who ranked the highest on it? What ranked the highest? Well, yeah, it's more of a what than a who because uh, Tino Livermento, as mentioned in the three-word match reviews, uh, did not find a happy homecoming today. Uh, Chelsea absolutely kicked the shit out of him multiple times. Uh, We're probably pretty lucky to get away with a lot of it uh, upon review. Uh, I rewatched the first half before redoing this pod, and Kukurea had a couple of real tough, tough challenges on him. Um, Did not find a whole lot of joy. Uh, in the area in general, it was a very physical match. A lot of really bad tackles across the pitch from both teams, but yeah, Tino, uh, unfortunately did not get the homecoming that he thought he was going to look. I I'd like to make a submission, a late submission for a non-player. Is that allowed? Okay. Yes. Ian Wright 
who I think is a phenomenal commentator. Yep. If we could get that guy actually commentating on the matches, I think all of us would benefit. The world would benefit. There might be peace in our times if we could have that happen <laughs> over some of the people that we currently put on comms. But I would say his comment before the game, and again, this is opinion, but the opinion does not look good after the game. His opinion was, I would choose Anthony Gordon ahead of Cole Palmer for England at the Euros. Again, we don't have a dog in the fight in this show. Like it, we, we are absolutely rooting for Team USA all the time. We definitely wish the England team well, but again, you know, we're, we're not picking sides here. Yeah, Cole Palmer had a day. Cole Palmer had a day. Anthony Gordon did not. And this is just exhibit Z or Z in the case file of why you would want to bring Cole Palmer to the Euros for England. Just saying, I think maybe that was the wrong choice today. So Cole Palmer might have taken it personally. Yeah, well, I mean, shoulder shrug, chilly celebration. Uh, Cole Palmer is an absolute stud. We are going to talk much more about him as we enter the rest of this podcast. Yeah, look, we've got a couple of individuals, Cole Palmer, Nico Jackson, and Mel Augusto, all with some impressive individual performances, but we're going to tie into all that in just a moment after this quick ad break, so stay tuned. All right, so as we alluded to, Nick, there's a couple of players that caught our eye and definitely made an impact. This felt more like players deciding that the narrative of where Chelsea's season was going wasn't, wasn't something they were happy with. They weren't content with with the ending that had been written and decided, nah, dog, I'm going to write a new ending. I'm going to get a couple of my friends to help me write that new ending, and we're going to get the result that we're looking for. And I think I want to start with Nico Jackson. I think Nico Jackson had a pretty complete game, and I know there's people afterwards who are like, well, did he mean the flick? Did he mean the flick for the goal? Do you have eyeballs? <laughs> Do you watch it? Have you seen it? He clearly makes an attempt to flick it in the goal. Why is there a question about this? Like, I mean, I get it. We're not a great watch at times. Like Chelsea have not been good. We've spent a lot of money, but like, if you are so narratively blind that you can't analyze whether a player moved his foot toward the ball and an exercise to score a goal, you're bad at your job. End of. Look, I think that's a very fair assessment. They would give the XG on the individual shot 0.3, except goal on target 0.35. So it's a very, very big chance opportunity there. Anything that's 0.3 higher would qualify as a big chance. And it was a really good goal. But I think it was about the way he contributed, particularly in the second half, in the way that he was finding himself outright, getting forward when he needed to, going up against a pairing of defenders in uh, Fabian Schar and then, you know, for parts of the match, uh, Botman. Uh, Botman. Uh, you know, it, not necessarily the easiest duo to defend, you know, to go up against in terms of the defense versus attack, but he acquitted himself well. I thought it was a really strong, more complete, more well-rounded performance. I still think the question will be asked this summer of like, do we have the right complement of attackers? But he has a place in this side. He has a place in this side for the rest of the season, and he definitely has a place heading into next season with the way that he's contributing. He's a developmental attacker. He's still, a, relative to the individuals hosting the show, a relative, relatively young man and absolutely has a ton of potential for him and is showing up when needed and I think made the game easier for a couple of his peers. Oh, no doubt. I mean, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I mean... The three that you mentioned, Gusto, Jackson, Palmer, all purchases that I have no doubt are going to make it at Chelsea Football Club, right? These are all guys who, despite their age, have performed admirably for the club this year, right? Have really put up stats, have put in big performances, have put in match-winning performances, all three of them. Um, on Jackson, I thought his performance tonight was excellent. Um, he made so many runs. He pressed so high, you know, without... Without Connor Gallagher at, at full strength, obviously, he was battling a virus over the last week. He had to be the person to lead the press, to do a lot of the pressing. He did a lot of the dirty work, too. He tackled back. He made decent passes. He made so many fucking runs in the second half that we couldn't get him the ball for most of them. He could have scored two or three today with, with the runs that he was making in behind, knowing that 
Newcastle play a silly high line at times for reasons that I don't understand because their defense is weird and more meant to park the bus than it is to play a high line. But, you know, it's neither here nor there, I suppose. I, I thought that he had a very good game. Yes, he meant the shot. Yes, he was offside for the other goal that he did put in, and he shouldn't have been offside for that, and that's a bummer. But, you know, you, you look at the fact that, you know, he did play a complete game as a striker when that isn't necessarily his best position and utilize the space in between either center back and the fullback when the fullbacks would get forward effectively to create a one-on-one and pull the center back out toward him to create space for other players. I mean, that there's some real intelligent play happening here and it's creating all sorts of opportunities for the likes of Cole Palmer, for the likes of Raheem Sterling, all these guys who are in the attack, even Connor getting forward. Like I, I think if you're, if you were on the fence about Nico Jackson heading into the season at this point in the year, I would be much more on the, he's definitely going to make it side of the fence than not. Have I been frustrated with his yellow cards this season? No doubt about it. I've been very animated about that on the show, but overall he's producing, he's putting up numbers and we need numbers. We need people to take their chances. And he's done that. I'm, I'm really happy for him. He has gone four matches in a row now. Again, not to jinx anything without picking up a card. And just something what are you, to keep Opta in Joe? mind. What's happening here? Come on. Don't, <laughs> Opta don't Dan do it, is man. really, really trying to fuck <laughs> with things here. Look, the goal that in this game puts him on 12 goals for the season, three assists across all competitions. That's a really healthy performance. And then even if you start to pull it down into just the Premier League season, I mean, that's nine goals and three assists. I mean, he's getting very, very close to that 15 number that we kind of said is like the initial benchmark and then 20 plus in any capacity with the remaining games we have is definitely within reach and would be a really, really stellar first season for him. And again, you know, I, I know we sometimes get accused of picking favorites and talking about players in particular, but I, I don't know. Uh, with all the doom and gloom, with all the things that aren't going right, I want to take a moment it, with the way that we're talking about Nico Jackson and where he's at and his kind of play is that it's an evolution of a game. It's measured over the course of a season. And there are moments, like you mentioned, the offside that are frustrating and will continue to frustrate. And then there are moments where we need to celebrate and recognize where he had a more complete performance in the entire game. And I think in terms of you know performances that are continuing to excite, I mean, do you want to take Jackson or do you or do you want to take Gusto or do you want to take Palmer first? I'll take Palmer first. I mean, kid's a stud. He's a stud. I mean, there is no other way to put it. Obviously, you you think about the goal, the second goal that goes in at a time where Chelsea didn't start the second half in the worst possible form that we've ever seen, but it wasn't like a phenomenal breakout start either. It was fine. It was average. But that goal comes at a critical time. You know, he'd obviously been in and around the attack all game. He'd been causing all sorts of problems for poor Dan Byrne, trying to track him down. And I can't imagine how little fun that Dan Byrne had tonight uh, as a six foot nine left back trying to track Cole Palmer's little shifts and movements and stuff like that. That couldn't have been a fun assignment. Um, but he tortured him. And then, you know, he also basically just created so much space for Gusto to get in behind that Gusto had an, an excellent attacking game as well. A little less good on the defensive side, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You know, the goal is hit pure. I mean, it was such a good strike. It was such a pure strike. And it's what I want our players to do more of, to have the confidence to do more of. You know, I the minute that went in, the first thought in my head, Dan, was where the fuck would we be without him this year? And the answer is not good. It would be like giving ourselves our own Everton style point deduction if we had not signed and played Cole Palmer the way that he is currently playing at this moment. I mean, 24 goals and assists across all competitions. That's an a either goal or assist every 108 minutes. Uh, a friend of the pod, Rob Journalism underscore RP with the for context. Juan Mata in his first season got 32 goals and assists in all comps over 4,000. 78 minutes in 54 appearances, averaging one every 127 minutes. So again, we're not saying he's Juan Mata, 
But if we're saying comps to first season and a first season where Juan Mata had more games to play at Chelsea, then Cole Palmer, unfortunately, is going to get an opportunity to play this season. That is a very, very good benchmark for him to hit in first season of men's senior football in the Premier League is really, really exciting. And I I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that he should absolutely be and has written himself into like the short list of like young player of the season for the Premier League by a mile. Like he'll like Connor Bradley from Liverpool will be up there. There's a few others that will be up there, but like 24 goal contributions, he will get 30 minimum by the end of the year with the way that he produces. And you think about the amount of points that we'd have without him and the impact that he's had on the very few points that we do have. Like I, it's, it's not hyperbolic to say that he's going to be our player of the season pretty convincingly. Now, I think it's not hyperbolic to say that whatever happens next year, that this whole team needs to be structured around him. Like that's how good he's been. Like, I I think you did, you didn't know what you had in August or September 1st, whatever it was. And now you have clear cut one of the best young players in the world on your team contributing at an incredibly high level in his first season. Like, I mean, we, we're, we're lucky. I guess blind squirrel finds a nut in the transfer market every once in a while. But like you, you, you think of like what this kid could be mm-hmm. with a clinical striker ahead of him with a you know, a, a more, you know, some, maybe some fresher legs in midfield behind him, Reese James behind him, you know, on, on the right-hand side, like pretty tasty, man. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I am so fucking high on this kid. I think that he is absolutely a star in the making. And what I, what I liked most about his performance today is there was a couple of times where he and Connor got in each other's way ball goes out instead of like remonstrating at Connor or whoever else got in his way. Sometimes it was Nico, like where they just weren't sure where to be and they occupy the same space. He waited till like a break in play ball goes out of bounds or whatever. And you look, he looked over and the camera would sometimes pan to him and they would just be talking like, I'm going to be here. You go to the other spot. Like don't. And it wasn't like yelling at each other. He's just calm he doesn't feel the pressure that a normal person would feel in those moments. And I think for a young guy, man, like that is just, it's outstanding. I mean, it really separates the cream to the very top. Well, Squawka pointing out that he is the first player to score and assist in five different Premier League matches this season. Goal and assist versus Burnley, Tottenham, Sheffield, and Newcastle, and then had the two goals and an assist versus Luton. When Pochettino was asked, was Cole Palmer a bargain? He didn't need to say the resounding answer is yes. Next question. He did go into giving a few more words to the journalist and letting him know that uh, he's doing things that maybe before was a little little bit not to have a player that can link the game today. He's doing well. He's doing fantastic. He's getting more mature every day. And of course, I think he needs to improve, but he's doing a very good job, giving him the modest recognition with hopes he continues to push and excel his peer uh, within his peer group. But last but not least, Malagusto. I think you mentioned on defense wasn't necessarily the best day out, particularly on the first goal, but boy, oh boy, he is fun to watch when he is getting an opportunity to blast forward down the field and get some really, really fun patterns of play, some fun interchange in the, his passing. Like he re- I think he relishes it. I think he loves attacking. He is a swashbuckler through and through. Yeah, he's complete sauce up front. I mean, he is fantastic absolutely fantastic and you know i i think the defensive side will come you know i think we got a little taste of what he could do with more of an offensive role against brentford when we played the back three and i think him him having that security blanket right center back behind him where he has where he had the freedom to get forward and really become like really be a right winger almost in, in that way uh, was a lot of fun for him. I think today he kind of forgot at times that he wasn't a right winger, <laughs> which 
you know, it, not saying he was terrible defensively, but, uh, you know, of course, there were a couple of critical moments in there that weren't fantastic. But again, you, these three, all purchases, you know, I know that he was technically in last year's fiscal accounting, but all purchases made within the last year, all studs. I mean, all, all guys who are contributing massively to this, to this team. And again, this is another one. Where would you be without Cole Palmer? Where would you be without Nico Jackson? Where would you be with Reese James injured for a majority of the season with no timeline to return? Where would you be with Malagusto? Nick, Nick, we just won a game. I don't want to have that nightmare now. Don't it's, put, don't put I, that on I, me, Ricky Bobby. <laughs> It shows the importance. And I mean, you know, we talked to Matt Law when when they made this transfer, you know, last January, and then we waited till the end of the season, you know, for him to finish up with Leon. And it was, you know, Matt was so high on it. He, th- he thought it was the most clever transfer we made. It's showing to be that. Like, his technical ability on the ball is outstanding. Like, I, I would bet in a contest of techers between him and Palmer and Enzo, there would be some real competition in there, not fake competition, real competition. And I wouldn't be surprised if he won a couple of those. Like he has some games. So does Nico Jackson too. Nico has some real sauce, but like these are technically gifted guys. I think once they sort out the intricacies of playing in the Premier League after the season, hopefully they become a little bit more savvy. Let's put it that way. Sure. And it'll be good. Look, he did win six of eight ground duels, none of his aerial duels, only two. He'd lost possession 13 times, one foul, and was fouled once. He had 68 touches, accurate passes 83%, one accurate out of five crosses. So the delivery, not as pinpoint in this match, but still finding ways to get forward and get involved in the match. But we have a couple other things we want to talk about. And maybe this is a good point to transition to this idea of how the make fish makeshift defense struggled against the Newcastle's fervent attempts to try to disorient Chelsea. But we're going to do that right after our last ad breaks. Stay tuned. So Nick, it was a little stitched together because Tiago Silva was on the bench, bad one, bad shield, Levi Colwell, Reese James, You've got plenty of people in rehabilitation, reconditioning phases within Chelsea's medical tent equivalent. And there's no blue tent in in soccer or football. But boy, oh boy, we could fill one with who Chelsea don't have available. So with Kukurea coming back, Disasi, Chalaba, and Gusto, it was not the most stout defense we have seen across a 90 minute Premier League performance. No, no, there were, there were some errors in there for sure. I think, you know, there are a lot of people who blame Trev for the first goal. I've rewatched that sequence about four times. There were three clear cut opportunities for us to clear the fucking ball out before it ever got to Trev. So Let's let's attribute each person who didn't clear it out 25% of the blame. I think that's Trev, that's Connor, that's Mallow, and I think it's Caicedo um, was the fourth one. Uh, they all get 25% of the blame for that goal in my mind because the ball should have never even got to Trev. He was the fourth one uh, that screwed up and, and stepped out when he didn't need to. Um but for those who are blaming him wholly for the first goal, please go rewatch it. That is not what happened um, in any way, shape, or form. Um, outside of that moment in the first half and a moment of stupidity from Kukurea in the second half, the defense was, and f- it was fine. It was good enough. It wasn't phenomenal, but it was, you know, steady Eddie for the most part. Um, you know, I. I but there were a couple of, you know, I mean, Newcastle had three shots on target. You know, it wasn't like a clinic they put on against us or anything. It was it was good enough to get the job done. I think the, you know, I think Trev, again, he's only in his third match of the season. Um, so, you know, I think you can forgive him. Kukurea, which we'll, we'll talk about here, um, you know, I'll pass to you, is only, you know, playing his first game back since late November, I think. Uh, or December. So, I mean, this is not exactly the the strongest um, 
part of the the lineup here, but I thought that Trev for the most part played really well. I thought Dizasi uh, returned to being better than average today, and you know I think Gusto obviously contributed in other ways, but it, you know it was it was good enough for the most part out of in, in open play to do a job. Um, there were two moments of clear madness that created a scenario in which Chelsea did not win this game like five nil, and that sucks. I think the other thing is there's a lot of questions about Chelsea's playing out of the back and wanting to maintain possession and, you know, the, well, we're not going to kick it forward. I mean, the reason we don't kick it forward often, we are tiny. We are a very tiny Premier League team. The two individuals, so when you think about it, Moises Caicedo is 5'10", Enzo's 5'10", Cole Palmer is over six feet, he's like 6'2", Connor Gallagher is actually listed at 5'11 and a half. Very, very specific there. Let's make sure we get it down uh, to the, the brass tacks on it. Raheem Sterling is 5'7", 5'8". I mean, Nico is 6'1". Uh, so, I mean, you, you don't have a lot of very, very tall players as targets. And, I mean, when you kind of, you know, you flip it the other side. I mean, again, we're, we're not, it wasn't Giants versus Giants, but you also have Dan Byrne on the pitch for a little bit too. Not saying that he's playing really far forward, but he's playing up against your attackers who are trying to get separation it's not giving them an opportunity necessarily to even compete for the ball. And so if you're just kicking it to turn it over, then why not kick it to somebody who might be under pressure, but at least could release it back to you. And so I know it's super maddening when you watch it live and you're like, why are we not just kicking it out at times? And there are individual moments where we say it, we don't want to even think about defending a set piece. Like this is the other thing. We're so afraid of this idea of defending a set piece defending a free kick that we we really try to ride our luck and i think that's where the right player recruitment the right balance of players on the pitch to give you a little bit more of the the physical edge that you need in terms of the distribution of height of the ability to compete in set pieces again it's not all about just how tall you are too it's about vertical jumps your ability to get up and compete aerially we've got some people like ben chilwell is actually really good at competing early, but he's not also Mm. the tallest guy we have on the pitch. And so like that combination is so manufactured at the moment that I think there's this fear that we're seeing of, Oh, we've been really bad on set pieces. We've been really bad with dead ball opportunities. We want to avoid those altogether. And so we'd rather risk playing it out with a couple of players who maybe aren't as confident with their distribution or with the ball at their feet, which again, as a professional footballer and someone watching them who doesn't play, it feels weird to say that, but they aren't as comfortable when someone's running down at them, trying to make that pass with, you know, to Petrovic, back from Petrovic to, you know, I mean, Caicedo, I think has done a, jo- a good job over the past couple of games, getting better and better at receiving. But like, ultimately, I think that's where if we're trying to just analyze, like, why are we doing this? Like it's, we don't have a tall team. We have a tall team. You have a taller team, you can play the ball out forward from your goalkeeper a lot more easily and expect to retain the ball. Like when you can't retain the ball and you're just giving it away, take the risk to maintain possession because ultimately through possession, usually you win a football game. But uh, yeah, there's there were a lot of questions. I mean, Kukrea, I, you, know, you want to give him a little bit of grace because it's his first game back in quite some time. But boy, oh boy, Connor Gallagher was really struggling. And Connor Gallagher had a heat map where... He was bright red on the left-hand side in between our goal and the halfway line. And that is kind of prime left-back area. So not not terribly great for him, unfortunately. Well, and Kukurea, you know, I think just he is who he is, right? He's going to – he played super aggressive tonight. Um, you know, he really – you know, threw himself into a lot of challenges. Physically looked healthy. You know, after being out for as long as he was, but you know, he makes a critical mistake in the 90th minute. He he jumps out, misses everything, and allows a free hit on goal. And it was a hell of a hit by Murphy, of course. And you know, he he put it up for 90. There's nothing Petrovic can do about that. But you know, it's 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 a critical error, and it you know, I think it's not the first time we've seen him make that same error. It's just something he has not been able to get coached out of his game by uh, now his fourth different coach. Um, And that's not good, man. It's, it's not in the Premier league. You get, you get absolutely 
squashed for things like that. You know, you get squashed for leaving that much space for a player, even of Jacob Murphy's <laughs> caliber, which, you know, again, he's, he's not like the best player in the world or anything. He put it up or 90 and just smashed it. You get, you get, you get punished for that stuff, man. Uh, and you just can't do it. And he does it far too often. And it really puts, you know, put a comfortable Chelsea win into not comfortable territory uh, because of of that. And I think you mentioned, you know, let's talk about the end of game before we get to Mudrik, but this team all season has struggled at the end of games to to keep a lead uh, and looks panicked, looks incredibly bereft of confidence, doesn't do the simple things right. You know, you think about so many of these moments that have happened throughout the the season where the team just looks absolutely, you know, critically panicked. And that's a coaching thing. That's something you can look at. Pochettino, why aren't, why aren't we practicing this? Why aren't we practicing end of game scenarios every single day? And if you lose the ball in an end of game scenario, you run three miles. Like, you, it cannot happen, man. It can't happen. You have to know to go to the corner flag. You have to know when when you're on a, f- a break and you have options right and left, don't keep it and lose possession. You have to know this stuff. You know, and it's, it's not just on Pochettino. You know, the players have played a long time. They know what to do. But, like, it, it just seems like we consistently don't do the small things at the end of games that other good teams do. And it costs us sometimes. And, you know, it costs us. This one, look, lucky it didn't cost a result, but cost everyone's blood pressure for the better part of eight minutes. Look, we should do some investigation into the clutch gene and figure out how we can just get every individual in this team to have a little bit more of that and uh, augment the genome appropriately, get full Gattaca in this situation. But ultimately, if we want to talk about someone who had a great cameo and the fact that, you know, Pochettino did make the sub, right? So, I mean, you know, this was a, a good sub in that, you know, as he went to attack, as he went in to find his opportunities, really, really bright. I mean, it was within five minutes of coming on the pitch. He found himself with a goal. And the only problem was like, he was getting to play further forward. He was giving a little bit more of a free role. It was more like, look, just run at him. They're tired. Get involved, interchange with Jackson, interchange with Palmer, get the ball from, uh, from, Con- uh, from Connor and just go make things happen and be a little bit of a disruptive force. And he did that really well. I think the only challenge is once we went up three, we went back to this like, oh, we're just going to try to see this one out mentality. We're not going to be as aggressive. We're not going to be as assertive, which doesn't suit this side to the point you made. Like we don't have the ability to do it comfortably and we should just go attack again and go attack again because this team, knowing that they're down, by two goals, knowing they need to get one back is going to be ultra aggressive within their press. They're going to get caught in mistakes. And, you know, you almost could have had another goal or two. And that would have been, I think, a better way to celebrate this in terms of a performance if we had taken our chances there. When Pochettino was asked about Mudrik, he was asked about what does he have to do to earn a run of games in the team? He said it was a very good goal. He scored a really good goal, and that's what we expect of a player that came from the bench and impact. Then it's about to compete with different players in the position he could play and then deserve to play. It's more of a question for him than me, which feels a little... Feels pretty disingenuous, man. I don't, li- I don't like, love that answer, just to be fair. Uh, I, I haven't loved much of his press lately, to be candid. Um, it's a fantastic goal. Actually, when I rewatched the goal and then I saw the, you know, the different angles of the goal, it's a very, very technically sound goal. Um, uh, you know, again, joking in the text group with everybody. Um, as soon as he came on and made a, uh, what, what the text group said is a crisp pass. Everyone lost their mind. I was like, guys, it's only one pass. Obviously you guys are being ridiculous. And then he goes and scores this goal and makes me look like an idiot. So there you go. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it's a phenomenal goal. It, it, he is a quandary, though, right? He is he's a big time quandary. He, he can do that. He can do the hard thing, the dribble through two players thing, the you know round the goalkeeper, score the goal thing. 
And then you watch him after that. You you know, that, that goal is a 76 minute. You basically watch him after that moment. Not much to speak of. And yeah. th- that that to me is like. It, you know, if I were him and I looked at Raheem Sterling's performance today, which was pretty average to bad at, at best, especially when you consider the fact that he didn't square the ball for what have, would have been the easiest second goal of the year. And that's about the fourth time he's failed to do that this season. I, uh, If I were Mudrick, I'd be licking my chops. But, he, you know, you have to put in a complete performance. You have to put in complete training to be able to, to beat a guy like Sterling who, you know, has trained under Pep. He's, you know, trained to Liverpool before he knows what's going on with this league. And, you know, again, I'd be, if I were Mudrick, I'd be looking at that as, a, as the opportunity to play that, that, that position is open for, for business and he hasn't solidified it yet. It's a phenomenal sure. goal. It's a great moment. It's game winning moment. And he should be really proud of it. I hope to see more of that, you know, consistency, um, especially, you know, against a, a really terrible defensive structure from Newcastle. Like they were all over the place today. This was not the stout Newcastle that we've seen. They, their press was broken so easily and we should have taken advantage of it more. Let's put it that way. I mean, this, this is the Newcastle side who have started shipping a lot of goals. I mean, this is the Newcastle mm-hmm. side that went to penalties against Blackburn Rovers, who ended up getting beat 4-1 by Arsenal. They, they did beat Wolves 3-0, which maybe that puts us in a good mood for the next time we have to go, uh, you know, play Wolves again at some point in the future. Thankfully, not in, uh, not in the current year. Um, but look, we won. means we get to run down the match poll. A lot while. of people. D- lo- yeah, look, it's off. been a long time. Uh, it could be a limited time offering. Look, uh, it's <laughs> it's an election year over here. There should be a lot of voting. We want to want to have a lot of voting to inspire the idea of voting. But Chelsea need to win to make that happen. Uh, at least have a comprehensive draw. But I put Cole Palmer, Nico Jackson. I actually put Caicedo, and I think people were upset I didn't put Gusto in there. Um, look at. Eight and a half percent for Moises Caicedo and other. Neither Gusto or Caicedo or any other choice was going to win because Cole Palmer ran away with it at seventy nine percent. Nico Jackson at twelve percent. I I think fundamentally got most of it right. So I'm just going to take the uh, take the dub on this one. Dan, I ran my own poll before the game. <laughs> oh boy. Um, yeah, <laughs> which you know I, I don't do that often, but it was kind of fun. Uh, I said, so how are we feeling about the match? And I gave three options, which was good, win incoming, meh, draw incoming, terrible, loss incoming. And uh, terrible loss incoming won with 40% of the vote, followed by meh, draw incoming at 31%. Only 29% felt good about this. And I get it. I honestly get it. And then, and then the one that I loved is Andrew Williams comes through and says, terrible, but still win incoming <laughs> question mark. And I was like, that is the full gamut of emotions. Uh, so, so well done. Uh, I thought it was a, a good little exercise. Well, taking a look around the premier league and the results from this round, it was man United kicking off, beating Everton to nothing Bournemouth and Sheffield drawing each other to a piece Luton and crystal palace. Also drawing one apiece. wolves ended up beating Fulham to one arsenal beating Brentford, unfortunately to one Tottenham for nothing against Villa and Villa picking up the red card, absolutely putting in jeopardy. Aston Villa finishing top four ahead of Tottenham. Brighton uh, finishing one nothing over Forest. West Ham Burnley 2-2 draw with a David Dotra Fafana banger on loan. Absolutely incredible goal to watch back. That felt like a real center forward style performance that we might want to take a look at during preseason, which we'll talk about in a second. Liverpool won, Man City won, keeping the top of the table extremely tight. At this point, Arsenal and Liverpool both on 64 points at the moment, just separated by goal difference. Man City on 63 points, and then it is a bit of a drop-off. 55 points in fourth Villa, 53 points to Tottenham in fifth. Man United continue their absolute luck with 39 goals, somehow have 47 points in sixth position. Uh, They have 20 less goals 
than Tottenham and Aston Villa. <laughs> they have less goals than West Ham and Brighton and Wolves and Newcastle and Chelsea, who are all beneath them in the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, and 11th spots in the table, which is just absolutely absurd, absurd and shows you that luck is absolutely something you have to manufacture sometimes, and they're doing it in Manchester, unfortunately for us. Yeah, I mean, you look at the table, we're still 11th. We're on 39 points, Newcastle on 40, Wolves on 41, Brighton on 42, West Ham on 43. Um, George Smiley uh, on on Twitter points out next four league games, Burnley at home, United at home, uh, Sheffield United away, and Everton at home. So three of the next four league games at home. Uh, two of those were against the bottom three. Uh, so, you know, put a guarantee those are going to be way tougher than they should be for reasons um, not to be explained. But you have a game in hand. Uh, that game is Spurs. Um, so a chance to, you know, potentially take some points off of Spurs, which would be fun. You'll have another game in hand after this weekend, which was going to be Arsenal. Um, so we're going to have to go and play them at their place in, in a future moment. But, you know, you beat Burnley, you get some points back. United essentially becomes a six pointer for that race. You know, it's like you, you beat them and it's a whole different ball game. You know, Sheffield are, are hopeless and Everton are pretty crap. So, you know, you, you think about where this this Chelsea team could be if you if you're able to get 12 points there, which again, we've not put two good back-to-back performances together this year. So expect a really crap or average performance at the weekend against Leicester. Um, but if you're able to somehow break that streak and go on a run where you win five, six, seven in, in a row, League FA Cup, all that stuff, you know, you could creep up the table. You know, do I still think that six is a bit of a stretch from where we are? Maybe. Depends on if you beat United. But that is essentially where the line is like that is our ceiling is sixth right now. I don't, I don't see us catching Spurs in fifth or, or anything above that. So, you know, the math, the math has to math, Dan. That, that one would be a little difficult if we're just uh, being honest there. I mean, you would need, I mean, just on kind of current points, you know, we, we have 33 potential points left in the table. So, I mean, you think the 39 we have at 72 would be our maximum if we win out this season, which is not happening. I mean, we play United. We have the, you know, the benefit or privilege of getting to play most of the teams above us in Brighton and Villa and West Ham before the end of the season. Those are absolutely crucial games. And if you can beat them, that lets you get the jump up. That's three points off of them. That's three points on for you. As you mentioned, it's six pointer. You could be in a position where over the next three to four league games, you're back in eighth place, seventh place, and looking at six being realistic. I mean, I think that getting into seventh, getting into eighth, as uh, as George Smiley put in his tweet, uh, definitely not out of the realm of possibility and should be where Chelsea are trying to kind of get over the um, next few games. Uh, but Nick, it is an FA Cup weekend. It is a match against Leicester, and that is where we're heading. We are heading to to another game at home against Leicester, going to play one and two in the championship table <laughs> in our FA Cup run. Yeah, we got we got fortunate with this draw. It's Chelsea Leicester on Sunday, uh, alongside United and Liverpool on Sunday. Uh, so that that'll be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, Wolves Coventry on Saturday and City Newcastle on Saturday. So, you, you know, again, you're you're one win away from playing at Wembley in a semifinal. You know, obviously the record at Wembley recently not phenomenal, but uh, you know we did win a semi against Crystal Palace there a, a couple of years ago. So maybe we'll uh, be able to do that again. But you know, I, I just want to see the team put another good performance in. Like Monday to Sunday is not a huge stretch for the legs. Like they have plenty of time to recover. They have plenty of time to get a comprehensive game plan together. They'll, you know, like Lester not playing their best football of the year right now. So I think we're, we're in a decent spot, 
you know, I, I just want to see the team put in a complete performance and start to build momentum. You know, we referencing the turning point number 73 at the beginning of the podcast, like that is, that's where we are. Every time we think, Oh man, surely this is the moment where we're going to do a job. It, it ends up being something catastrophic and, uh, and vice versa. So I just hope the team levels out a little bit, wins the games they're supposed to win, including this game on Sunday, and just does the job. It's important. Speaking of the team doing the job, the team is going to be doing a job this summer as Chelsea are coming back to the U.S., for another year running running for their preseason tour. And I think while there's a lot that can be said about the preseason tour, what does and doesn't work, um, I'm going to say what does work for us in general, Nick, is getting an opportunity to see friendly faces across the U.S., getting to enjoy a uh, cold beverage of your choice and choosing with a couple other Chelsea supporters, uh, maybe a few 50, 100,000 of them as uh, you kind of tour across the country occasionally. There have been two matches that have been officially announced. There was also the reporting from The Athletic on the Man City-Chelsea game in Ohio that has come out too, but officially through the club. Chelsea versus Wrexham on Wednesday, July 27th in Santa Clara, California at Levi's Stadium. And then Chelsea versus Club America on Wednesday, July 31st in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Going back to Atlanta two years in a row. Um, we don't have any plans yet, just as we want to put out there. Uh, the tickets are available for pre-sale at the moment. There's information on Chelsea's website to go get those locked in. If you're part of a supporters group, you probably already have information through your local club chapter. The chapter heads are the most amazing people. This is the busiest time of year for them because all the people who haven't been going to the pub because the team has been terrible are now reaching out and saying, hey, I want tickets with the other Chelsea supporters that I hang out with. So please be patient. Please be kind with them. Please think about them in this moment and uh, be thoughtful and go hang out with them at the pub. Even if the football is terrible, you're going to have a way better time than just sulking at home when Chelsea don't do the business. So I think Nick, yeah. we, the message is that we just were excited. Um, we know there's a lot of challenges with the a summer tour. We hope the club is continuing to learn season over season, how to do it better, how to take better care of the players during that time frame. You know, obviously there's matches, there's, media access, there's commercial sponsorship commitments, and it's definitely going to be a doozy coming off of the Euros and all the other club and team soccer that's taking place this summer. It's going to be a really, really tight window. It's going to be a lot of travel. And just hopefully um, the club can do the best by the players and, and put out a good product, that the pitches can be safe, and we can see uh, you know Chelsea play a couple games, and we can see wonderful people across the U.S. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of fun in the last two summer tours, so hopefully uh, everyone else is doing the same and getting prepared. And, you know, I know it, it is a strain on the local chapter who's hosting uh, each event. So uh, if you're able to help them, if you're able to volunteer and, and help them get set up, it's obviously going to be uh, critical to the amount of fun that you have. Um, you know, the folks in uh, you know, Raleigh Durham last year, the folks in Atlanta, the folks in Philly, the folks in DC all, uh, did such a tremendous job of putting on great events and hosting great, uh, night before parties and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, you, you have plenty of advanced notice with a few of these, maybe some surprises down the road in terms of announcements, but, um, yeah, just get involved if you're excited about, you know, seeing the team come back for a third consecutive year. You know, there were, there were, there was a, you know, eight year gap, you know, not too long ago from when the club was here. And, uh, now we have them three years in a row. So, you know, don't take it for granted. It's the thing, uh, treat it as special as it could be, uh, but look, that's going to do it. That's the end of this episode. We added a little bit of extra flavor at the end there. Some, uh, spice from Arrakis there to give it a, wonderful feeling a little bit of lighthearted element here at the end and make you see some visions of what a future summer could be with you and your fellow chelsea supporters that's gonna do it for this one so until next time chelsea fans you know what to do keep the blue flag flying high <laughs>